Hi guys, good afternoon. Uh, this class is a class on one of the greatest writers ever. His name is Edgar Allan Poe. It would be hard to find a literature fan who hasn't heard of him, right? And he's considered as one of the greatest American writers ever. He has been called many names. He's the master of horror. He's the master of macabre, right? And <clears throat> Poe is even regarded as the founder of a specific literary genre called the detective fiction, right? And his short stories are popular, especially on Halloween parties, yeah? uh, when people retell them at night. His stories are that good. Uh, Poe died exactly uh, in 1849, October 7th, the Hall uh, Halloween, uh, Halloween month, right? And <clears throat> he was a person who created his own world, a world based on human fears and um, terrors. And his, this world seems to amaze and attract millions of readers from all over the world. Now, if you search for Edgar Allan Poe's biography in Wikipedia, let me tell you, it is very boring, right? Mm. Let us approach his biography in a different way uh, by looking at some lesser known facts of Edgar Allan Poe's life. Number one being, Poe is believed to have never signed anything Edgar Allan Poe since the name Allen came from the foster father he didn't get along with. He therefore signed documents with Edgar A. Poe or E. A. Poe. Written in 1841, his The Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, a short story, uh, this has been considered as the first modern detective story. Mr. Dupont, the fictional detective of the story, has served as a model for many subsequent fictional detectives, including Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot. In 1835, Poe, at the age of 26, married his 13-year-old cousin, which is weird, Virginia Clem. She died of tuberculosis in 1847, and her struggles with the illness and death are believed to influence Poe's work. Now this one is good. Charles, I didn't know this. Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe were pen friends and even met once in Philadelphia when Poe was 34 year old and Dickens was 31. Apart from literature, one of Poe's favorite hobbies was uh, space and cosmology. His 1848 essay called Eureka, a prose poem, contained a theory that presaged the Big Bang theory by 80 years. And that is Poe. Uh, Poe's death remains as mysterious as the author himself. On October the 3rd, many say it's October the 7th of 1849, Poe was found on the streets of Baltimore in dire conditions and died four days later in a hospital. All medical records, including his death certificate, have been lost, which has raised many suspicions concerning his death. From heart disease, some say it was from epilepsy or cholera, up to suicide, even murder. Now, this is a picture uh, this is an illustration of the original uh, cask of Amontillado, uh, which is our topic today. And uh, this picture tells a story. And this picture is full of what we call motifs and symbols and 
Poe uses these motives and symbols in a very different way, yet it all comes back to the reader at the end of the story. Now, uh, before beginning to read or study cask of the cask of Amontillado, we must be aware of some terms, right? Mm, because, as you all know, Poe was using them for the first time. Yeah. And the very first term is makob. Makob is known as uh, the quality of having a grim or ghastly atmosphere. The makob walks do emphasize the details and symbols of death. Uh, the term also refers to works of particularly gruesome, that are gruesome in nature. The next term that we must be aware of is roquelaire. It is a noun. Um, it is a kind of a gown or a cape that was worn and it was lined, uh, it was like a cloak that covered the whole part of the body. And we see Montresor wearing that cloak. Okay. Uh, the next one is the very term Amontillado. Amontillado is a variety of sherry, a wine, uh, characterized by being darker, right, than fino, but lighter than oloroso, both types of wine. And the color has got to do, uh, got to do something with the story as well. The color of Amontillado is something which resembles blood, right. Now, coming back to the cask of Amontillado, it is not a tale of detection like the murders in the Rue Morgue or the purloined letter. There is no investigation of Montresor's crime and the criminal himself explains how he committed the murder. The mystery in the cask of Amontillado is in Montresor's motive. Without a detective in the story, it is up to the reader to solve the mystery. Now, going back to the publication history of the cask of Amontillado, we can see that it was a personal reaction of Poe and like Montresor taking a revenge upon Fortunato, Poe was taking his revenge on uh, Thomas Dunn English, his personal rival. English was a friend of Edgar Allan Poe, but the two fell out amidst a public scandal involving Poe and the writers Francis Sargent Osgood and Elizabeth F. Ellen. After suggestions that her letters to Poe contained indiscreet material, Ellet asked her brother to demand the return of the letters. And Poe, who claimed he had already returned the letters, asked English for a pistol to defend himself from Ellet's infuriated brother. English was skeptical of Poe's story and suggested that he end the scandal by retracting the unfounded charges against Ellet. The angry Poe pushed English into a fist fight during which his face was cut by English's ring. Poe later claimed that, uh, to have given English a flogging, which he will remember to the day of his death. Though English denied it. Either way, the fight ended their friendship and uh, stoked further gossip about the scandal. Later that year, Poe harshly criticized English's work as part of his literati of New York series published in Gaudi's Ladies Book, referring to him as a man without the common school education, busying himself in attempts to instruct mankind in top topics of literature. The two had several confrontations, in, usually centered around literary caricatures of one another. Poe thought that one of English's writings went a bit too far 
and successfully sued the other man's editors at the New York Mirror for libel in 1846. That year, English published a revenge-based novel called 1844, or The Power of the SF. Its plot was convoluted and difficult to follow, but made references to secret societies and ultimately had a main theme of revenge. It included a character named Marmaduke Hammerhead, the famous author of The Black Crow, who uses phrases like nevermore and lost Lenore, referring to Poe's poem, The Raven. This parody of Poe was depicted as a drunkard, liar, and an abusive lover. Now, Poe devised his revenge and uh, wrote the cask of Amontillado. And uh, Poe responded with the cask of Amontillado using very specific references to English's novel. In Poe's story, for example, Fortunato makes reference to the secret society of the Masons, similar to the secret society in the novel written by English and even makes a gesture similar to one portrayed in 1844, it was a signal of distress. English had also used an image of a token with a hawk grasping a snake in its claw, similar to Montresor's coat of arms, bearing a foot stomping on a snake. Though in this image the snake is biting the heel, in fact, much of the scene of the cask of Amontillado comes from a scene in 1844 that takes place in a subterranean vault. In the end, then, it is Poe who punishes with impunity by not taking credit for his own literary revenge and by crafting a concise tale as opposed to a novel with a singular effect as he had suggested in his essay, The Philosophy of Composition. Now, uh, coming back to the cask of Amontillado and its motives and symbols, the interplay between the motives and the symbols had the ironical effect. And this has become the hallmark of Poe's prose style, which leads the reader through the catacombs of a criminal mind. That interplay culminates several times in the story as talismans or points of flux where um, different ideas converge and form a unified field of meta-narrative stability. These are hard words. Now, motives. Motives are defined as uh, dominant or recurring ideas in a text. There are several motives in the story, but I would like to draw your attention towards the most intriguing one, which is the Montresor family coat of arms. As you can see, uh, the Montresor family coat of arms is a golden foot on a field of blue, crushing a serpent that is biting the heel of the foot. Now, a golden foot represents the Montresor family's pride and the serpent biting symbolizes Fortunato's crime, which we are not aware of until the end of the story. Who doesn't talk about it throughout the story? We, we never know what the motive of Montresor's revenge is, what Montresor's criminal act is. The actual act of crush, crushing the snake signifies revenge exacted. Now, this interchanging of fortunes is a suggestion that since the names Montresor, which means my treasure, and Fortunato, the fortunate one, mirror one another. You have to be fortunate to have treasure, right? There is a psychological reciprocal identification between the victim and the executioner. If we look at the coat of arms from a very different angle, 
a more allegorical meaning comes out. The golden foot becomes Fortunato, stepping upon the snake Montresor. The biting of the serpent, the serpent becomes the sneaky and cunning Montresor. And the actual act of crushing the serpent forever links them in a form of mutual existence. So, two questions arise and neither have an answer. Is the snake biting the foot because it has been stepped on? Or is the foot crushing the snake because it has been bitten? Now, this is a uh, illustration by Claire Hamel and this illustration comes closest to the representation of the atmosphere or the setting of the cask of Amontillado. It has got a carnival scene at your left. There are the two main characters in the middle and in the right there is the crypt. Okay. Uh, coming back to the setting, coming to the setting, the setting becomes the most important symbol in the story and the entire story in fact is peppered with quadruple symbols. Here are some examples. The name in itself Montresor, Montresor in French means my treasure. The treasure the narrator possesses is the knowledge of the perfect revenge. Fortunato's outfit. Fortunato's carnival garb is described as follows. The man wore motley. He had on a tight fitting party striped dress and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. In short, Fortunato is dressed as a fool, a symbolic representation of what he is. The carnivalesque setting. The supreme madness of the carnival season represents the supreme madness of the narrator's mind. It is the backdrop of the carnival season that lends the story its fantastic nature, a nature trumped only by the madness of Montresor's revenge. The very word cask. The word cask a sturdy cylindrical container for storing liquids and the word casket, another word for coffin, have the same root. Montresor and Fortunato refer to nitre several times. Now what is nitre? Nitre is basically a potassium nitrate salt formerly known as saltpeter. Saltpeter is composed of the name sal or salt and petre or rock, literally salt of the rock. And quoting from the text, but observe the white web walk which gleams from these cavern walls. This is a picture of a jar found from a catacomb in Spain. In Spain. Uh, it, it is encrusted with white ancient nitre. And the nitre therefore represents web or the trap Montresor has set for his victim. <clears throat> now these motifs and symbols work towards irony. The third most important point in the in Poe's stories. Irony is a literary technique originally used in Greek tragedy by which the full significance of a character's words or actions is clear to the audience or the reader, although unknown to the character. There are several junctures of irony throughout the story. The name Fortunato. Fortunato means fortunate in Italy an ironic name for someone about to be walled up in the catacombs. 
Montessor's very first words to Fortunato are, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. Fortunato thinks Montessor means he is happy to see him because of his expertise. What Montessor means is the meeting is lucky because the carnival presents an excellent time for murder. Montessor's continued efforts to talk Fortunato out of coming with him only to serve to excite the latter and encourage his coming. Now, uh, Montessor's instructions to his servants demonstrate his mastery of human psychology. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. This is Montresor talking to his servants, talking about his servants. Uh, these orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, or as soon as my back was turned. Later, right at the beginning of the, uh, right at the end of the text, Fortunato exclaims, I will not die of a calf. Montessor responds, true. It appears to be a hopeful statement. It actually is a wicked statement. He then drinks to Fortunato's long life, which Montessor soon ends. The conversation regarding the Masons demonstrates an ironic misunderstanding. Fortunato refers to the Masonic order, a secret society of brothers. Montessor pulls out a trowel, a reference to bricklayers. In that respect, Montessor is a Mason. Fortunato's last words before being chained to the rock are, he is an ignoramus. In reality, Fortunato is the ignoramus, a chain to the wall ignoramus. Montessor's reaction to the crime he commits is described as follows. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. His heart grows sick on account of the weather, not because he just buried a man alive. That's ironic. Now, there are some points, I found, found out three, of special focus. These are points where all the motifs and all the symbolisms, all the symbols and the ironic elements mingle together to create magical effect. Um, number one is the trowel the actual tool of a mason while laying bricks. The masons in fact were a widespread fraternal organization that started as a medieval guild for stonemasons as the name indicates but it grew into a more general social organization. There is a long history of anti-masonic suspicion and many stories have circulated about it being a secret society and even a mystical one. These attitudes grew so strong in 1826 that the anti-Masonic party emerged as a political party in the United States. The paradox here is that Fortunato shows his hand gesture that he is a member of the organization. But when Montessor shows the trowel, he shows he is or will act as a literal mason. However, because Fortunato reads this as a joke, he misses the clue that he'll be entombed alive. Now, the next one is the motto. The motto, the Latin motto under the Montessor coat of arms. It reads, Nemo impune lacessit. Well, I am very bad at Latin, but even I could use my common sense and come to a conclusion that Nemo means nobody. 
me me impun impunity right and lesser set must mean something close to lesser rate so it isn't hard even for a non latinist like me to figure out that the motto is saying something like nobody injures me and gets away with it now um, historically it is uh, a scottish motto uh, this was in fact the motto of the scottish royal stuart family the motto of the chivalrous scottish order of the thistle and the motto of several scottish regiments historically scotland fought against occupation by the romans and the english please bear with me i am getting to a point some sources trace the origin of the motto to the roman emperor julius caesar who led the roman forces into england who was killed by members of the senate more so for his potential actions or threat to democracy than anything he had actually done now like caesar fortunato's crimes against montresor remain vague the third most interesting point of juncture in the story is the vault itself the catacombs as montresor guides fortunato to the vault where he supposedly is storing the amontillado he guides him through a literal place of death this is the montresor family crypt where members of the family are buried there is an actual mound of bones in these catacombs while one could store wine in a crypt the physical conditions are similar one would not expect wine that was recently purchased to be stored far far back in this catacomb there is wine here but it is also a place of death and bringing fortunato here foreshadows his fate and lastly given the strong association of wine with christian communion this can also be seen as a dark parody of the christian story of reincarnation jesus was placed dead in a tomb but returned alive fortunato though is placed in a crypt alive and never returns except in montresor's memories 50 years later where the story ends thank you